Hello, this is Tim Brooks with the Brooks Group and the Ultimate Selling Team at Keller Williams Realty, and I wanted to welcome you back for our training on the Maryland Purchase Contract Addenda. This is going to be an interesting training session, and we're going to cover what paperwork actually goes with the core contract that's submitted by the buyer that is not provided by the seller with the initial disclosure packet that's usually published online with the property listing. So what we're going to cover in today's session is going to be all of the different addenda that can be part of the uh, the contract that the buyer is going to provide but not what's actually provided by the seller in their package. So those five things can be either the financing addendum, inspection addendum, first time home buyer addendum, seller contribution addendum, and then finally the addendum of clauses. Now the addendum of clauses actually encompasses all of those other things into just one simple addendum. That's why I like to use it rather than having say four or five different addenda, this one actually uh, puts all of those together in one document except for the uh, first time home buyer addendum. Also remember you can go to paragraph 17 of the core contract and if you're not sure what all needs to be included you can kind of go down that checklist there and see what applies to your specific situation and then you'll know what to include and what not to include. Now the first addenda we're going to go over are the financing. Now that's conventional, FHA, and VA. Conventional financing usually requires a higher down payment but it's going to be the best rate and terms and the cheapest type of money to borrow. Usually it includes no mortgage insurance also. FHA requires only two and a half percent down but there's going to be a mortgage insurance premium there but that's a very good option for first-time home buyers also then there's VA financing which is no money down it's an excellent source of funding for veterans so let's start with conventional financing the conventional financing addendum we're gonna start at paragraph A and they're numbered by letters specified financing now, there's only a couple things that you actually have to fill out in the conventional financing addendum, and this is it right here. So first deed of trust, that means it's going to be a first mortgage. You'll see there's also second deed of trust too. So there was a time when it was popular to do a first and second mortgage combined uh, for the purpose of avoiding mortgage insurance. You don't really see a lot of second uh, second mortgages in purchase transactions these days. So under where it says first deed of trust, buyer will obtain or will assume a first deed of trust. Now it's rare to assume but it is possible. Um, so check one of those, usually it's going to be obtained. And uh, let's see, the lender issued a pre-approval or the lender to whom buyer made or will make written application as required by this contract in the amount of and then you're gonna put the percent of the loan to value so let's say the buyers putting 10 percent down you're gonna put 90 percent in there so they're gonna get a loan for 90 percent of the sales price for example or if they're putting 15 percent down it would be 85 percent of the sales price that they're gonna borrow etc so that's the loan to value percentage right there and then sales price amortized usually that's gonna be 30 years so amortized over 30 years at a and, and rates today are almost always fixed. Now when rates were much higher, adjustable rates were very popular uh, prior to the market crash. But just see, whatever the terms are going to be, usually it's going to be a 30-year fixed mortgage. And then the interest rate, whatever the prevailing rates are of the day, uh, for a while they were 3.75 or 3.625, 3.5 even, then 4% now, uh, 4. 375 was the, the latest prevailing rates that we've seen. So just put whatever the interest rates are that are kind of average for uh, what's going on right now. And then as we move down, financing contingency, paragraph B, this contract is contingent on buyer's ability to obtain specific financing. Uh, and then paragraph C, seller's option to void contract. So the buyer has to deliver by 9 p.m and then you'll put in the number of days. I usually put in 25 because that's a reasonable amount of time to apply for the loan, to order the appraisal, get all the documents, and actually have an underwriting approval. 
underwriting is actually the process by which a lender submits all of a, a buyer's documents, their W-2s, pay stubs, etc., including the appraisal, everything that a, a, a bank or a lender is going to need to make a decision to lend money or not, and that's called underwriting. So 25 days after date of ratification is usually what I put, but you can actually put anything in there as long as it's acceptable to the buyer and seller. Now this says that if you don't get a conditional commitment or a loan commitment from the lender, and that's a specific letter that says loan commitment letter, that's saying that this file has been through underwriting and is approved. It doesn't mean it's necessarily clear to close, but it means all of the major items have been provided. Now this can also be a conditional approval, meaning it's approved subject to the buyer providing uh, certain documents for a clear to close. Anyway, so if the buyer does not provide that by 9 p.m. after that number of days, then the seller can give written notice to withdraw from the contract. And let's say the, the buyer also wants to obtain alternative financing, they can do so and as long as they provide notification of that then the uh, I, the financing contingency is still in effect, however the seller can withdraw at that point. Then we're going to have the removal of contingency paragraph here. Anytime prior to the seller delivering notice declaring the contract void, buyer may remove this financing contingency so that the seller can no longer uh, void the contract if you go over the certain number of days. But that does mean that the buyer is on the hook for the deposit after that. And let's see. Financing rejection. Buyer may deliver notice declaring the contract void if buyer receives a written rejection for the specified financing from lender and delivers a copy of the written rejection to seller. So if you ever use this financing contingency to get your buyer out of a contract, you do have to provide uh, a letter from the lender that's it's a decline letter declining the loan and then they'll give a specified reason of, of why it was declined. Now just know that a lot of lenders do not like to actually issue those lenders because there's certain certain reporting requirements that they have to file with their regulatory agencies that, that regulate the banks and finance. Appraisal paragraph F, second page. In the event the specified financing is declined based upon the appraisal, buyer will not be in default. This provision will apply even if the contract contains a separate appraisal contingency and that appraisal contingency expired or has been removed. So if the appraisal comes in low, the buyer can withdraw without losing their deposit. However, there is a, um, they have the ability, the seller does, of lowering the sales price to meet that appraisal requirement and then they'll be okay. Now paragraph G, this is important, buyer default provisions. These are the things that the buyer uh, could possibly do to be in default of the financing contingency. So buyer will be in default if settlement does not occur on the settlement date as a result of any of the following actions by buyer. One, failure to lock in the interest rate and the rates increase so that buyer does not qualify for such financing. That one is particularly relevant today because rates are going up. So um, buyers are qualifying for less and less mortgage uh, the higher the rate goes. Two, failure to comply with lenders' reasonable requirements in a timely and diligent manner. We've all had those clients that are slow providing their documents, their W-2s, pay stubs, tax returns, etc. So this is important for them to get their stuff in. And three, application is made with an alternative lender other than the lender as defined herein, and that alternative lender fails to meet the settlement date. Or four, does not have the down payment, closing fees, and other required funds. Five, makes any deliberate misrepresentations, material omissions, or inaccuracies in financing, financial information that results in the buyer's inability to secure the financing. And six, Failure to make application to lender for the specified financing or application for property insurance within seven days of date of ratification or seven does or fails to do any act following the date of ratification that prevents buyer from completing settlement. So any of those 
uh, items, one through seven right there, will cause the buyer to be in default of the financing agreement and therefore have their deposit in jeopardy. And uh, paragraph H, uh, sale or settlement, lease of other property. So this says that uh, unless specified in uh, a written contingency, this is not contingent upon the sale of some other type of property. And then I, lender require repairs. This I this doesn't really come up too much for conventional loans. You, I've never seen any uh, lender require repairs for this. Uh, usually it's FHA, VA, and USDA that you're going to see most of the lender require repairs. However, that being said, uh, this just says that if, as condition of providing financing under this contract, the lender requires repairs to be made to the property that have not otherwise been agreed to, be, to be the seller's responsibility, then the following procedure will be followed. Buyer will deliver notice to seller of lenders require repairs and a request that seller complete the repairs prior to settlement. Within five days after delivery of buyer's notice, seller will deliver notice to buyer as to whether or not seller will make the repairs. Now this is where this is different, say, from the, uh, the normal in, uh, inspection contingency which is coming up. This says, failure of seller to deliver notice to buyer within said time frame shall be deemed an election of seller to not make the repairs. If seller delivers notice to buyer electing to not make the repairs or is deemed to have elected to not make the repairs, within five days, buyer shall deliver notice to seller as to whether or not buyer will make the repairs. If neither seller nor buyer has delivered notice within said time frame agreeing to make the repairs, then this contract will become void. So basically, the seller has a certain number of time to say they will or will not make the repairs. If they don't respond, then it's an election to not make them. Then it goes back to the buyer, and the buyer can actually make the repairs themselves or not. Uh, and if they don't make, if they don't do, take any action, then it's an election not to also, and then the contract becomes void. We're in a normal inspection contingency once a request for repairs has been submitted, usually if the other side doesn't respond, it's an election to make the repairs. So that's where this deviates a little bit. I hope that wasn't too, convin uh, too confusing. Now we'll move along to the FHA financing contingency. Okay, now the FHA financing addendum is very similar to the conventional financing addendum with just a couple different little changes in it. So real briefly, of course, you've got paragraph A again, which is the first deed of trust, and uh, it's the very same thing as the conventional uh, finance, financing contingency, paragraph A also. Okay, the buyer will obtain or will assume, check one of those, the, uh, the percent of the sales price, the term, 30 years or whatever it is, and then the interest rate. So it's exactly the same. Then we move along to paragraph B, financing contingency, and this also is the same as the uh, conventional contingency. You put in, you know, it's 9 p.m. and the number of days after ratification, and then um, if the buyer fails to remove the contingency, what will happen? And then um, if settlement doesn't occur by the settlement date and the contingen contingency has not been removed, then what are the terms of the buyer being in default? And again, if you look at it, it's almost verbatim exactly what it was in the conventional financing contingency. Okay, page two, appraisal provisions. Now this is where the FHA addendum deviates a little bit from the conventional uh, financing contingency and this, this appraisal portion is very important. The appraisal also is a little bit different for an FHA or a VA loan than say a conventional. Also, when an FHA appraisal or VA appraisal is done on a property, it gets assigned to that property for six months. So even if this buyer doesn't purchase the property for whatever reason and backs out or it falls through, and somebody else comes along and does an FHA loan, this appraisal will pop up and stick with this property. So whatever the value is or the lender required repairs, it stays with this property for six months. It's kind of a, uh, an important thing to note, especially if you are the listing agent or the seller. Okay, so FHA amendatory clause. 
It is expressly agreed that notwithstanding any other provisions of the contract, buyer shall not be obligated to complete the purchase of the property described herein or to incur any penalty by forfeiture of deposit or otherwise unless buyer has been given in accordance with the the HUD slash FHA or VA requirements a written statement by the Federal Housing Commissioner, Department of Veterans Affairs, or a direct endorsement letter setting forth the appraised value of the property of not less than, and then right there you're going to put the purchase price amount. So if the property is, if you agree to a purchase price or or at least in this case, you're you're setting forth an initial offer price. You're going to put that offer price in there. So the property has to appraise for not less than that amount. Buyer shall have the privilege and option to proceed with consummation of the contract without regard to the amount of the appraised value. The appraised value is arrived at to determine the maximum mortgage of the Department of Housing and Urban Development will ensure HUD does not warrant the value or the condition of the property. The buyer should satisfy himself herself that the price and condition of the property are acceptable. Notice the dollar amount to be inserted in the amendatory clause is the purchase price as stated in the contract. If buyer and seller agree to adjust the purchase price in response to an appraised value that is less than the purchase price, a new amendatory clause is not required. So let's say you actually put your offer price in that uh, the blank space there and then you negotiate a different purchase price you're gonna have to go back and also change the purchase price here as well so that it reflects the actual ratified purchase price paragraph paragraph two procedure in the event of a low appraisal in the event that the written statement setting forth the appraised value of the property the written statement indicates a value less than the sales price buyer shall deliver notice to seller stating either a that buyer elects to proceed to settlement at the sales price in the contract or b requesting that seller change the sales price to a specified lower amount of not less than the appraised of value buyer's notice buyer's notice shall include a copy of the written statement in and when they say written statement they're talking about the appraisal in the event buyer's notice requests a price reduction notices delivered subsequent to the delivery of buyer's notice shall be treated as follows within three days after notice delivery from one party the other party may a deliver notice accepting the terms contained in the other party's notice or b deliver notice continuing negotiations by making another offer or c deliver notice that this contract shall become void at 9 p.m. on the third day following delivery unless recipient delivers to the other party notice of acceptance of the last delivered offer prior to that date and time in which case this contract will remain in full force and effect so they either uh, um, accept the uh, whatever the new price is they make some sort of counter offer or uh, or everyone can do nothing and withdraw after thir uh, three days. Failure of either party to respond within three days of notice delivery will result in this contract becoming void. Now here's the thing too. Let's say this, this option B of renegotiating the contract, that's all fine, but if they negotiate the price to be something above whatever this appraised value is, the buyer has to bring the difference in cash so and the, the the bank will only loan money on the property based on the appraised value so anything above all of that then the buyer has to bring it in cash paragraph D seller loan charges the total amount of any lender charges which cannot which cannot by law or regulation be charged to buyer will be paid by the seller termite inspection there is a termite required Expenses and outbuildings shall be included in the inspection and certification, and then lender required repairs. This is exactly the same as the uh, lender required repairs of uh, uh, the conventional contingency. And let's see, so it, if, as a condition of providing financing under this contract, lender requires repairs to be made to the property that have not otherwise been agreed to, 
to be seller's responsibility, then the following procedure will be followed. And then it goes through exactly what the other one went through. Now, there is also another, this is the GCAR version of the FHA financing addendum. There's also an MAR version of it that actually has a blank spot in there for a certain amount of lender required repairs that the seller agrees to pay up front. I actually prefer that version of this contingency. For example, I always put, say, $1,000 in that blank, and it'll say that the seller agrees to pay $1,000 towards any lender required repairs. That means that if any show up, you're not going to have to go back and renegotiate any of this stuff. They've already agreed to pay up to $1,000. It's very rare to have a lender required repair beyond that amount. Usually it's chipping pain is a common one around the uh, uh, the outside of the property, etc. So again, I prefer that version. And finally, uh, page three, just the uh, um, certification and FHA required notice that just is the buyer acknowledging receipt from HUD of uh, for your protection, get a home inspection. And you're going to throw that into your, your offer package as well. And moving on to the VA financing addendum. And again, this is pretty similar to the other two financing addendums. Let's say there's a, uh, just a couple little things here that, that we'll cover because it's, it's very similar. So paragraph one, same thing. We have to go over the loan details again. There's the VA funding fee. Now that fee, you're going to go ahead and check with your lender. The amount of that fee is going to depend, the percentage, on whether it's the first time or if they've used their VA loan more than one time. That, that funding fee changes. And put the base amount in there, total loan amount, loan program, term of the loan, how many years, interest rate, etc. Uh, put all that stuff in there. And then uh, now also in paragraph one, VA financing is prohibited from paying certain charges. The seller hereby agrees to pay such charges not to exceed. And then there's a dollar amount. Usually uh, that's going to be zero for whenever I submit these. Um, same thing with up above there, buyer agrees to pay lender loan origination or discount fees of, usually I put that to be uh, um, zero. And then... Uh, Paragraph two, monthly payment. Paragraph three, loan underwriting. Paragraph four, veteran administration guaranteed loan. Okay, so these things here are uh, just very basic paragraphs. Payment uh, to lenders shall include monthly principal and interest plus one twelfth of the annual real property taxes. Uh, the loan underwriting buyer and seller understand that lender will have to resubmit the loan to underwriting if from the time the buyer's loan application was approved to the time of settlement, there are any increases to the interest rate and or the loan origination discount fees. Uh, let's see. So under paragraph four where it says VA loan, it talks about the deposit, that it be placed in an escrow account. Uh, also, this is where it's going to say that the, uh, um, the purchase price must be reasonable to the appraised value. This is just a different way of saying the same thing that was in the appraisal contingency portions of the FHA and the conventional financing addendum. It's the same thing with the same provisions of how many days they have to respond if the appraisal comes in below the actual uh, purchase price. And then finally, uh, on page two, VA fees buyer agrees to pay at settlement a VA funding fee equal to and then whatever the percentage is find that out from your lender and uh, then you're gonna also check in here if they want to pay the funding fee at settlement or if they're gonna build it into the loan itself usually 99 percent of the time they just uh, put the funding fee they roll it into the loan amount itself okay termite inspection same thing just like FHA they've got to have the termite inspection Lender required repairs, just like we talked about with FHA addendum. Here it actually is, where you see that blank space there, the repair amount, where I usually put $1,000 in there. That's When that's in there, that's the seller saying they're agreeing up front to pay up to $1,000 in repair amounts if it shows up in the VA appraisal. So let's say the, the appraiser mentions a certain number of repairs that must be made 
the seller is already agreeing to a certain dollar amount up front of those repairs. And then it gives the provisions on what to do if, uh, if there are repairs that are required. Okay, now let's move on to the property inspections addendum. So paragraph one, scope and limitations of inspections. So this is basically, uh, like it says, setting the scope and limitations. So it's not talking about the future condition and performance of the above systems. It's how is the property right now, the seller isn't warranting what's happening in the future with it. So this addendum and the inspections provided herein is not for the purpose of making items of a routine maintenance and or cosmetic nature the subject of further price negotiations between buyer and seller. So we get into paragraph two. Now paragraph two select, um, specifies the items to be inspected. And the next two pages are basically going to be what is covered here. So the main thing is going to be structural and mechanical. So what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to have the buyer's initial that little, um, the basically the cross-shaped boxes. They're going to initial in each quadrant and then the seller will also initial there. I usually, as a standard, um, allow 10 days for our inspections. That's negotiable. It can be seven days, it can be three days, it can be two weeks. It's whatever is acceptable to the buyer and seller. So structural and mechanical, that's going to be the main portion of a normal routine home inspection, but then you can also elect to inspect mold in paragraph B or environmental in paragraph C. And then continuing along the top of page two is environmental again. And when we say environmental, what we're talking about according to this is the presence of asbestos, uh, the continuing or the existing integrity of underground oil or gas tanks, uh, the presence of solvents, paint thinners, formaldehyde, etc. Then moving along to D, radon. Radon is actually uh, one of the, the common ones that, that we actually use. So in, in this whole uh, four-page addendum, usually structural and mechanical, which is A and D, are the most common ones that, uh, that people pick. So radon's important. Radon takes a little bit longer to test and get the results back. So as you can see here, I have 15 days by default that I usually put. You can again put any date that you want, but uh, usually I have at least uh, 15 just because it can take a little bit of time to get the results back for that inspection. Then there's a chimney inspection. Sometimes people, uh, it's recommended that if there's a chimney that's been used that you have a chimney inspection done. Lead-based paint hazard inspection, if you have any reason to believe that there may be uh, lead-based paint if the property is older than 1978, uh, you can always put that in there. And uh, G, additional inspections, uh, any other type of inspections that you feel like you may need to do, then you can put that in there as a general inspection. And then uh, there's a little note at the bottom of this, note termite and other wood destroying insect infestation inspection terms are governed by the wood destroying insect inspection paragraph of the contract. So the um, pest inspections basically are covered in the core contract itself and this notice is just letting you know that. And then paragraph three, rights and obligations of the buyer and seller. This kind of spells out what that is. Seller shall make the property accessible for such inspections and shall have utilities and service at the time of inspection. Neither buyer nor any agent or contractor of the buyer shall in any way excavate, penetrate, or otherwise damage any part of the property without the prior written consent of the seller, nor shall any furnishings, boxes, or personal property belonging to the seller be moved or relocated unless absolutely necessary in connection with the inspection. If the property is part of a condominium, buyer will be given access to the common areas to perform the inspections. Buyer and seller shall have the right to be present during the inspections and buyer shall give seller reasonable advance notice of the date and time of the inspections. Now that's interesting there. Usually it's a little more uncomfortable if the seller is present, but this says they absolutely have the right. Generally though, when they tend to be present for the inspection, they get a little bit tweaked out sometimes when they have a home inspector going through and maybe being critical of the property. Paragraph four, inspection report process. Now this is, in my opinion, the most important section of this contingency. This is gonna let you know 
what the process is to submit an unsatisfactory report, how that works back and forth between the seller so there's no misunderstanding, misunderstandings and so that nobody misses any of the necessary deadlines to comply. So section A, waiver of buyer's rights to terminate contract. If within the time period specified, buyer fails to have inspection performed, or if buyer pursuant to paragraph 4C below fails to submit entire inspection report to seller along with a separate written statement indicating what conditions in the report are considered unsatisfactory and what corrective action is requested, buyer shall be deemed to have accepted as satisfactory said inspection report and buyer shall have no right thereafter to terminate the contract or request corrective action pursuant to the provisions of this addendum. If buyer elects to not not to request corrective action from the seller as a result of an inspection, buyer shall not be required to submit a copy of the inspection report to the seller. So what that is saying is if there's something unsatisfactory, the buyer must submit the inspection report itself and the statement of what is uh, considered unsatisfactory. Now that is actually going to be in the next document that we look at the inspection notice. But if everything's good with the inspection, the buyer doesn't have to do anything and the uh, contingency will simply expire within the, whatever number of days they had. Now section B here is important also and I really like my buyers to sign this and then I love it when the seller signs it because this paragraph is a general right to terminate the contract. If this is signed by the buyer and seller it allows them to withdraw from the contract for whatever reason based on the inspection but without having to specify any particular reason. Notice this paragraph 4B shall not apply unless initial by both buyer and seller. If this paragraph 4B is initialed only by buyer, then no binding contract shall be deemed to have been formed by and between the parties, even if this addendum has been signed by both buyer and seller, unless seller shall delete this paragraph 4B by strike through duly initialed by seller, which deletion shall be deemed to be uh, a counteroffer by seller to buyer for acceptance by buyer. If buyer wishes to accept the deletion of this paragraph 4B, then buyer shall evidence such acceptance by initials of buyer. And the actual paragraph says, buyer upon written notice to seller given within the time period specified for each inspection contingency shall have the unconditional right to terminate the contract for no stated reason based upon buyer's general dissatisfaction with the inspection results. If buyer elects to terminate the contract, the contract shall become null and void and all deposits shall be dispersed in accordance with the deposit paragraph of the contract. So this is a general dissatisfaction paragraph. And uh, if we represent the buyer, we always want as many contingencies as possible to preserve their deposit in case they decide they want to withdraw from the contract for whatever reason. So section C buyer's specific right to terminate contract. This is a very important section. Notice, this paragraph 4C shall apply in the event paragraph 4B is not initialed by both buyer and seller or if paragraph 4B is initialed by both buyer and seller but buyer elects not to terminate the contract pursuant to paragraph 4B. Within five days from receipt of notice from buyer of an unsatisfactory inspection report Seller shall notify buyer in writing whether seller, at seller's expense, will repair or correct all, some, or none of the conditions noted by buyer. If seller elects to repair or correct all of the stated unsatisfactory conditions, the contract shall remain in full force and effect, and seller shall repair or correct in a good and workmanlike manner and prior to settlement all of the unsatisfactory conditions noted by buyer. If seller elects to repair or correct only some or none of the unsatisfactory conditions or fails to respond within the five-day period, buyer by written notice to seller given within two days of receipt of seller's notice or from the date that such written notice was to have been provided by seller may elect either to terminate the contract or waive the right of repair or correction of any unsatisfactory conditions which seller with, will not repair or correct. If buyer elects to terminate the contract, the contract 
shall become null and void, and the deposit shall be dispersed in accordance with the deposit paragraph of the contract. If buyer waives the right of repair or correction of any conditions which seller will not repair or correct, or if buyer within two days of receipt of seller's notice fails to notify the seller of buyer's election to either terminate the contract or to waive the right to repair or correct any unsatisfactory conditions which seller will not repair or correct, the contract shall remain in full force and effect, and seller shall repair or correct in a good workmanlike manner and prior to settlement all of the unsatisfactory conditions which seller agreed to repair or correct. I hope you caught all that. So that's very important. Rewind that. Go back through that if you're not clear on it. Because that's the stuff that's either going to make you look like a boss with your client or jam your client up if you're not aware of those things. In paragraph 5, repairs, correction, reinspection. Seller agrees to complete repairs in sufficient time for buyer to inspect prior to settlement. Buyer shall have the right to inspect the property upon the completion of repairs or corrective action by seller to confirm that the seller has performed in a good and workmanlike manner all of the repairs and corrective action which seller agreed to perform. So they've got to be able to have time to go back in and reinspect the items. Don't have it completed the, the morning of uh, settlement. That's not going to work. That's just going to cause problems. And then number six is important also, damage to property. If buyer or buyer's agents or contractors damage the property during the exercise of buyer's rights under this addendum, buyer shall immediately reimburse seller for all costs incurred in correcting such damage. Okay, now we're going to move along to the property inspections notice. This document is your friend. Make sure you learn it inside and out because this is what you're going to use to either hook your buyers up or save your seller depending on which side you represent. So this is the document that's actually once your inspection is completed and there are certain items that are unsatisfactory you're going to use this document along with the inspection itself to send to the seller and you're going to request repairs or you're going to request a credit. I always think when I represent the seller anyway, a credit is always cleaner and easier. There's less chance for dispute. There's less chance for one side to think the repair is done and the other to say that it's not done. I've, I've had disputes like that before where a credit makes it very simple and just eliminates the issue right away with the seller giving up a little money at closing to the buyer. So I always try and go that way no matter which side I represent because it just is cleaner. However, Remember in our previous inspection addendum where it said structural, mold, environmental, radon, etc. So whatever portion it is on the uh, inspection report itself, wherever it falls in, you're going to just check whichever box that uh, we're objecting to or wherever there's an unsatisfactory item. And so we start by checking that box there and then uh, uh, that notifies them which inspection it was that was unsatisfactory and then notice from buyer to seller buyer gives notice to seller as follows and then we're going to check one of these three boxes a no ens no unsatisfactory conditions were found and uh, buyer is not requesting corrective action from the seller so no response from the seller is required at that point and then the c the contingency is removed or b Buyer elects to terminate the contract based on dissatisfaction with the inspection results. Note, buyer shall only have this right if buyer and seller have so agreed in paragraph 4B of the property inspections addendum. And in that case, no response from the seller is required. Or C, the buyer has attached a copy of the entire inspection report and requests that the following list of unsatisfactory conditions be repaired or corrected by the seller. The corrective action. Additional pages may be attached if necessary. So oftentimes what you'll see in these blank lines or uh, um, verbiage that's directly cut and paste from the report itself. However, if you're going to cut and paste from the report, you must make sure that, it, that you convert the language into an action item. That uh, the following list of unsatisfactory conditions be repaired. 
So you actually have to put what it is. A lot of times an inspector may just make some sort of statement, but you have to um, clarify exactly what it is you want repaired. And then if you move to page two, the buyer's gonna sign. And then there's a section for a response from the seller. So the buyer has submitted their request for repairs, and then the seller gets to respond. So the seller can A, agree to complete the corrective action as specified in paragraph 2C. No response from the buyer is required at that point because the seller has then agreed they're in agreement. Then the seller would just sign below. Or B, the seller will not complete any of the, the corrective action specified in paragraph 2C. Or C, seller agrees to complete some, but not all of the corrective actions specified in paragraph 2C. The following is a list of the unsatisfactory conditions that the seller will complete. So, and then the seller signs it. So whatever the response is, they'll either complete them all, no response needed, or they'll, they won't complete any, or will complete some, then that again requires a response from the buyer. The buyer then has some options there, which are below. Response from the buyer to the seller. Buyer, having received seller's written notice in paragraph 3 that seller will not complete any of the corrective action or agrees to complete some of the corrective action as specified in paragraph 3C, gives written notice to seller as follows, and then they check one. Buyer accepts seller's response and waives the corrective action of any unsatisfactory conditions that the seller will not complete, or B, buyer terminates the contract in accordance with the provisions of paragraph 4C of the property inspections addendum, and then they sign it, and then that's it. So they either accept the seller's response or they terminate at that point. Now also, let's say your seller wants to give a credit instead of repairing some items, I will check C in uh, paragraph 3 and then put in that the seller uh, will provide uh, a buyer credit of X number of dollars. And then that's it. So this is the, uh, the response back and forth for the buyer's request for repairs. Okay, moving along to the seller contribution addendum. You're going to use this if we're going to get the seller to pay any portion of the buyer's closing costs or if your buyer needs help with the uh, uh, the amount of money for their closing costs and we negotiate those terms. So, for example, we negotiate that the seller pay 3% towards the buyer's closing costs. This is the form that you're going to use for that and it's a very simple form. And Basically, it's just, uh, it says, in addition to any other amounts which the seller has agreed to pay under other provisions of the contract, example, origination, discount points, transfer, recordation tax, lender fees, etc., Seller shall credit buyer at the time of settlement with the sum of, and you can either put a dollar amount in there or a percentage of the purchase price towards the buyer's settlement costs. Usually that's negotiated in terms of percentage points. Um, it is the buyer's responsibility to confirm with the lender that the entire credit provided for herein may be utilized. If lender prohibits seller from payment of any portion of such credit, then said credit shall be reduced to the maximum amount allowed by lender. I have had that happen before where we were such bosses negotiating that we negotiated a seller contribution towards our buyer's closing costs that were so far above what the, send, the, the lender actually allowed for them that it had to be chopped to a percentage that uh, they actually allowed. And that's it. All right, and this brings us to the first time Maryland home buyer transfer and recordation tax addendum. You are going to use this in your contract if your buyer is and qualifies as a first time Maryland home buyer. We're going to go over just exactly what that is uh, here. And uh, let's see. So the buyer has now what qualifies as a Maryland first time home buyer for them to qualify for this exemption? A. The buyer has never owned residential real property in Maryland that has been the individual's principal residence and. The residence will be occupied as a principal residence, or the buyer is a co-maker or guarantor of a mortgage or deed of trust to be secured by the property, and the co-maker or guarantor will not occupy the property as a principal residence. Buyer is a first-time Maryland home buyer who will occupy the improved residential real property as a principal residence. 
So if they've owned property in some other state and they're moving to Maryland from out of state, they qualify. Okay, state transfer tax. Section 13-203B of the tax property article of the Annotated Code of Maryland provides that the rate of the state transfer tax is reduced from 0.5% to 0.25% of the consideration payable for the instrument in writing and shall be paid entirely by the seller. Section uh, or Paragraph B, Section 14-104C2 of the Real Property Article of the Annotated Code of Maryland provides that the entire amount of the state transfer tax shall be paid by the seller. So basically, the seller is not being harmed by this. It just means that it's split 50-50 and the state is waiving the buyer's portion of it. So this doesn't affect the seller in any way whatsoever. And two, recordation tax and local transfer tax. Section 14-104C1 of the Real Property Article of the Annotated Code of Maryland provides that the entire amount of the recordation tax and local transfer tax shall be paid by the seller unless there is an express agreement between the parties that the recordation tax and local transfer tax will not be paid entirely by the seller. However, that portion would harm the seller, but it is remedied just below, and this is why this is important that you fill this out correctly. Buyer and seller expressly agree that the cost of recordation tax and local transfer tax shall be paid as followed. And you see where it says other as follows, split 50-50 between buyer and seller. You want your buyers and the sellers to initial on that line. Now you have to fill out the split 50-50 between buyer or seller. So I have that in there by default uh, for my own contracts, but make sure that's in there. Otherwise, uh, guess what? Then the, uh, the seller has to pay and that seller's n not gonna be very uh, happy with that. And finally, this brings us to my favorite addendum in the whole wide world because it combines all of them into a simple three-page document. It just saves so much space. So we're talking about three pages versus the 16 that we just went through. However, your financing contingency ones, you're still going to need those. So as you can see there in paragraph one, seller credits to, uh, seller credits to buyer, and you're just going to put the amount or percentage in that space there. So that saves the uh, seller contribution addendum right there. So that's just paragraph one. Paragraph two is the inspection contingency. So instead of that four page inspection contingency that we filled out, we simply check the little box that paragraph two is in play and you're gonna have your buyer's initial there. And uh, basically I put 10 days in there. Uh, you're gonna also select uh, either paragraph A, right to negotiate, or B, right to cancel. I usually will uh, um, select both of those because we want the right to cancel for whatever reason or the right to negotiate. So uh, you're just going to select whichever one. And uh, if you'll notice there, it also gives the uh, delivery uh, deadlines there within three days after delivery of notice from one part or the other. The other party may, and then deliver notice accepting the terms. Uh, contained in the other party's notice, or two, deliver notice continuing negotiations or making another offer, or three, delivering notice that this contract will become void at 9 p.m. on the third day following delivery, unless the recipient delivers to the other party notice of the acceptance of the last delivered offer prior to that date and time, in which case the contract will remain in full force and effect. Now, do you notice it's the same exact verbiage? We've ju it's just condensed and it's simply a paragraph instead of two pages. So that's page one. Let's move to page two. So on page two at the top, we've got uh, paragraph three, additional as is provisions. So this is gonna be, if we wanna uh, just take this property as is, instead of using the as is contingency or as is addendum, if you will, we can just simply check paragraph three, initial it, and suddenly this property is as is. And it says here, all clauses in this contract pertaining to termites and wood destroying insects, private well and or private sewage systems in compliance with city, state and county regulations are hereby deleted from this contract. Smoke detectors will be installed as required by the laws or regulations of the appropriate jurisdictions. The provisions of the property maintenance and condition paragraph will remain in full force and effect. So. 
Paragraph three is simply your as is uh, paragraph. And radon inspection, paragraph four. So if you want radon, remember the 15 day time frame I had in my previous uh, radon inspection contingency, you would just simply put it in here and select paragraph four. Now, if you wanted an appraisal contingency, not to be used with FHA or VA financing, then you would check paragraph five. And finally, page three, paragraph six, holding the deposit check. So uh, if there's any uh, issue as far as holding the deposit check, for example, it's understood and agreed by all parties that the buyer has instructed the escrow agent to hold and not deposit the above described deposit check until blank days after ratification at which time said check shall be deposited. This is necessary because Maryland law is specific when it comes to deposit checks, so it must be agreed upon in writing. So there's your provision for that. And then paragraph seven, private well and septic. If the property is on well and or septic, buyer at buyer's expense or seller at seller's expense will, and then it gives the provisions for that. Now, that's why I like this uh, addendum so well because it covers all of these things. There was the private well and septic, like each one has its own specific addendum also. Uh, I didn't want to include those because we're simply including it here with this. And then finally, no, let's see, eight post settlement occupancy addendum. So if the, um, if the buyer or the seller needs a few additional days to stay in their property, uh, that's what a post settlement occupancy agreement is. A pre-settlement occupancy agreement is where the buyer moves in before settlement. So anyway, if the seller needs to stay over a few days and they agree to it, that's where you would put that in this addendum. And then nine, licensee relationship disclosure. Let's say you're selling a property, you've got a real estate license, that's where you would disclose that there. And 10, any other additional provisions, and that's it. So you compact so many things into such a small area, and if that wasn't good enough, there's actually an addendum of clauses B that's got a whole nother slew of additional uh, addenda that have all been combined together. So that is the addendum of clauses. All right, so to wrap up everything, we covered our financing addendum, both conventional FHA and VA and the differences between them, which are minimal. Inspection addendum, the inspection notice, request for repairs, first time home buyer addendum, seller contribution addendum, and finally the addendum of clauses, which really squishes all of those into one, except for the financing contingency, that is. So I want to thank everybody for sticking around for such a long session. This was probably our longest session to date. I wanted to break it apart, but just for continuity, we kept it all together. And so that's going to actually wrap up the uh, Maryland Purchase Contract Addenda. There's uh, a couple more that you may need that are a little more obscure thrown in here or there. Uh, and we'll, we'll handle those in a future training session. Again, I'm Tim Brooks with the Brooks Group and the Ultimate Selling Team here at Keller Williams. And once again, thank you for uh, staying with us with this training session. And I look forward to our next session.